son. A former professor, an ivory tower intellectual, thrown into the arena of world politics. He is the President of the United States. Within his lifetime, he will be acclaimed and idolized. But from his deathbed, he will see his dreams, his plans for world peace, crumble into dust. His name is Woodrow Wilson, and this is his biography. Wallace and this is biography. Our story, Woodrow Wilson. In the war-weary world of 1920, a sad and dying man pointed an accusing finger at the American people like a disappointed schoolmaster. We had a chance, he said, to gain the leadership of the world. We have lost it and soon we shall be witnessing the tragedy of it all. The man who spoke those words was Woodrow Wilson, 28th President of the United States. A visionary, an idealist. He was also a stubborn man. And his unwillingness or inability to compromise cost him his dream of an effective League of Nations. In 1912, Thomas Woodrow Wilson, a political newcomer, toured the country campaigning for the presidency of the United States. Americans suddenly found this man standing in their midst, shaking their hands, and asking for their vote. They knew very little about him, and they asked themselves, where had he come from? What had he done up until now? What were his qualifications for the nation's highest office? Born in 1854, he is the son of a Southern Presbyterian minister. The Wilson family has occupied parsonages in Staunton, Virginia, Atlanta, Georgia, and now in Columbia, South Carolina. At 17, Thomas Wilson is serious, studious, and straight-laced, as befits a minister's son. Thomas Woodrow Wilson changes his name to what he feels will be the more distinguished T. Woodrow Wilson when he graduates from law school. But after just one year of practice in Georgia, he gives up law. He is disgusted by the scheming and haggling of carpetbagger politics in the South. He starts a new career as a professor of law and history, and this time he's far more successful. By 1902, at the age of 48, as Woodrow Wilson, he becomes president of Princeton University. Believing he may just have political potential, the Democratic machine bosses of New Jersey persuade him to run for governor in 1910. Fresh from Princeton's campus, he wins an upset victory in the state election. He is a crusading governor filled with ivory tower ideals. As one New Jersey newspaper puts it, this long-haired bookworm of a professor came down to the state house and licked the machine bosses to a frazzle. Two years later, William Jennings Bryan, the most powerful voice in national democratic politics, is the force behind a Wilson for President movement. With Bryan's backing, the little-known governor of New Jersey is placed in nomination at the 1912 Democratic Convention. After 10 hectic days of speeches and demonstrations and 46 roll-call ballots, the nomination is given to Woodrow Wilson, a former professor and intellectual. This is the man who now asks for the votes of the American people. He loves the rough and tumble of the whistle stop campaign. Throughout the summer of 1912, Woodrow Wilson crosses swords with two seasoned political veterans. The Republican candidate is the current president, William Howard Taft, but his party is split right down the middle torn between his old guard conservatives and the progressives of the Bull Moose Party. Colorful, exciting Theodore Roosevelt heads the Bull Moose ticket. He's Wilson's most formidable rival. 
Roosevelt wants a government with far-reaching control of national affairs. He says, only by exercising the power of government can we curb greed that sits in high places. But Woodrow Wilson talks about a new age of freedom. The history of liberty, he says, is the history of the limitation of governmental power. Wilson's new freedom captures the imagination of the American people. On November 5th, 1912, he becomes the first Democrat in 16 years to be elected President of the United States. President Taft accompanies him to the inauguration. The former professor prepares to assume the enormous responsibilities of the presidency. of the Wilson administration. Tariffs are lowered on foreign imports to increase competition and bring down the price of goods. And for the first time, Americans will pay an income tax. Theoretically, it won't be felt by the little man, only by the rich. 1916 is an election year, and one great issue faces the president and the nation, the war in Europe. And British have fought the Germans, while the United States follows a policy of strict neutrality at Wilson's insistence. As the presidential campaign gets underway, Wilson leaves for the summer White House in Shadow Lawn, New Jersey. He will not go through the long, grueling cross-country trips he made in 1912. Instead, he delivers a speech each Saturday from the porch of his home. His theme is peace and neutrality with dignity and honor. Many Americans, however, oppose Wilson's policies. They agitate for American entry into the war. Wilson's neutrality barely carries the day. He's elected for a second term by the uncomfortably narrow margin of just 23 electoral votes. Germany unleashes unrestricted submarine warfare. For the first time, American lives and property are involved in Europe's war. U.S. merchant vessels are given guns to protect themselves. And the president issues a vigorous protest to the German government. But the Kaiser's answer? commits the United States to a course of action he has tried desperately to avoid. A 
Appearing before the Congress, he declares, Right is more precious than peace. The world must be made safe for democracy. Greeted. They call him the 
savior, the champion of peace, the Christopher Columbus of a new world. In England, he tells the crowd, the people of the world want peace, and they want it now. It is my duty to lend counsel to this great enterprise of humanity. The words of an idealist, of what one reporter called the shining, smiling man. In Italy, the welcome is even more triumphant, and it convinces Wilson that he is indeed the hope of the world. His call for a League of Nations is stronger than ever. Our task in Paris, he says, is to organize the friendship of the world, to see to it that all the moral forces that make for right and justice are united. On January 18, 1919, the peace conference convenes in Paris. Britain's Lloyd George has agreed in principle to Wilson's League of Nations. But he's a wily politician who wants England to have her full share of the spoils of war. Italy's Premier Orlando is less interested in a League of Nations than he is in recovering territories taken by Austria during the war. Premier Clemenceau, the Tiger of France, is quoted as saying, God gave us the Ten Commandments and we broke them. Wilson gives us the 14 points. And we shall see. And within a month, the Big Four, despite their quarrels and different aims, seem to be in agreement. The League of Nations is almost a reality. But Woodrow Wilson must hurry back to the United States. Congress is about to adjourn, and the President will have to be in Washington to sign or veto last-minute bills. He feels he has accomplished what he set out to do. Boston is deceptive. It is more an evidence of deep-rooted respect for the president than a sincere vote of confidence for his statesmanship in Paris. The sniping at his League of Nations has already begun. The opposition is led by Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. At a White House meeting, Wilson comes face to face with Senator Lodge and his supporters. The determined president states his position so unequivocally that Lodge bristles. Afterwards, Lodge calls the peace treaty ill-drawn and a breeder of misunderstanding. And Senator Frank Brandegee speaks of Wilson with venom. I feel, says the senator, as if I had been wandering with Alice in Wonderland and had tea with the Mad Hatter. Although physically exhausted, the president must return to Europe to sign the peace treaty. And with the treaty, he vows, he will bring back a League of Nations. He dares the Senate to turn it down. The formal ending of World War I. Leaders of every nation in the world gather to witness the signing of the peace treaty. At Versailles, in the Hall of Mirrors, the long conferences have whittled away at Wilson's 14 points. Most of them are no longer a part of the peace treaty. The final document contains instead an endless series of compromises. But still at its heart, there is the League of Nations. The final step for President Wilson must now be to win the approval of the United States Senate. President on his return, the Foreign Relations Committee, spearheaded by Lodge, expressed serious reservations about the League. Point by point, they demand changes that will undercut its power. Wilson rejects their suggestions. Instead, he decides to carry the fight to the people, to tell them why the treaty must be signed. He plans a strenuous nationwide speaking tour, despite the warnings of his doctor. It will be no strain on me, he says. On the contrary, I will enjoy it. The tour begins in Columbus, Ohio on September 4th, 1919. The whole world, he says, 
returns with outstretched hands to this blessed country of ours. The pattern of the trip is set here. The parade through crowded streets, then the impassioned fleet. someday will triumph than to triumph in the cause that I know someday will fail. Wilson's League of Nations was never realized, but his cause eventually triumphed. The United Nations stands as a memorial to his vision, his ideal. Mike Wallace for Biography.